I will talk about the possibilities and limits for localizing production through permaculture design. Um, so it's a little bit of an overview of um, how to get to a place where we can transform our, our agricultural systems to withstand it, uh, the challenge of the climate crisis uh, and also yeah, various other crises that we're going to see in the, in the next couple of decades. Um, so my interest in, in social change and ecological transformation um, has really been there since the early 2000s. And I've worked as a researcher in anthropology, mainly focusing on, on peasant uh, small-scale farming systems in Romania and uh, the relationship to, to state and uh, livelihood. And uh, after that, I, I sort of um, positioned myself outside of academia uh, and and looked more at practi practical approaches to, to face these, these crises since 2010 and became a permaculture designer. Um, so I've been interested in permaculture design, eco-village design and low tech uh, for more than 10 years now. And um, mycelium design is sort of the, the freelance brand that I use to, to, to do that work. And so that work um, includes uh, creating skills so doing lots of trainings, uh, both practical and um, also theory on ecology and, and various innovations to, to food production, also in collaboration with a lot of, um, a lot of people that uh, are specializing in, for instance, um, uh, seed development and also, yeah, small scale food production. Um, I'm also involved in something called the Airchef, which is an airship that we built in Luxembourg. Um, and it's a circular design center for education and research around low tech solutions for the predicament that we find ourselves in. And it's, this is so, this is when we mainly get towards young people between 18 or between 16 and, and 30 years of age, where we, we have longer term, um, volunteerships and, and also, um, yeah, working with various schools and, and organizations, um, to, yeah, to get get young people into a space where they're empowered to think about low tech solutions. In Luxembourg, if you don't know the context, uh, we don't have a lot of, of that sort of um, orientation because it's a very, yeah, a lot, a lot about sustainability is, uh, is around high tech and around, yeah, green growth and things like that, that um, it's, yeah, physically sort of not very possible. And then um, it's inside of the airship, um, some people, and since uh, 2020, I'm also, uh, I've been founding this uh, small scale farm in the border of Belgium, uh, Belgium and Luxembourg. It's a community farm where we have polycultures, um, mainly fruit and nut trees, and then also um, no dig vegetable gardening that's happening there with a variety of, um, of uh, plants that, um, we're going to commercialize, but at the moment it's mainly subsistence production. Um, and then the, the final aspect of my work is really accompanying various design projects. So for instance, um, this was the uh, National Forest Administration with an agroforestry project um, that I accompanied for a while for the design phase and to kind of see, you know, um, how, as Paul already mentioned, we can use agroforestry to um, replenish stock, uh, the stock of carbon in the soil, how we can reduce water uh, runoff and also erosion generally. And so these are some of my interests around um, and sort of my livelihood at the moment. Um, and yeah, Bruno Latour, who passed away um, at, the, uh, at the start of October, said something like, you know, the contrast between the calm with which we continue to live and what is happening to us is staggering. So basically, we're at, in this situation where we have all these crises happening and there's very little reaction. Um, and this is very concerning. Um, and uh, one of the models that I use a lot for education is the, the donut model, where we look at the social and environmental foundations and then in relation to planetary boundaries and sort of lay those on top of each other. And this is, for instance, the, the Luxembourg model um it's the 2020 sort of um 
screenshot of Luxembourg in terms of uh, its uh, greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution material throughput that's too high, but then also um, related to agriculture, this uh, freshwater eutrophication is, is one of the issues because of fertilizer runoff and uh, so forth. And then um, the CU means the carbon uptake. So we have also a lot of um, lack in, the, in that area. So that's sort of something that is uh, really at the, at the base of, of my work. And um, yeah, and sort of our targets are, are really a very big challenge uh, for, for us to reach. And I think, you know, also for the world at large, this is a similar issue. And so permaculture design has been part of my toolbox um, for um, over 10 years now, um, really taking these uh, ecological principles and putting them to work in the context of very small scale design, but also larger scale design for various hectares. And, and there's even people that are really specialized on, on, on large scale farming, farming design. Um, to kind of see how we can um, make systems that are self-sustaining, that don't need so much outside input, and um, and that are sort of also creating virtuous cycles of abundance that are not depleting the soil and depleting the hum humans, basically. So that's sort of also at the base. And, that, and it gets quite technical, but I'm not going to go there now. Um, and then this is also this idea of more systemic change, because um, at the moment we have a lot of, things masquerading as change in terms of the greenwashing that's sort of been amplifying in the last, um, let's say, 10 years, um, where, you know, corporate uh, social responsibility is sort of saying, yeah, we're doing stuff, but um, practices aren't really changing. And so there is a need for a reflection around systems change and how it can happen. And, um, and really, like, checking numbers or like counting greenhouse gas emissions isn't going to do the trick. There has to be a more deeper kind of change. And it doesn't include only, you know, our, our carbon, but also our, our fundamental behavior shifts. Um, oh, come on. Yeah, and I mean, I think we're going to see a lot more of the kind of desperate um, having people wanting to be heard, you know, like you have in, in the last couple of weeks. We had in Germany and France people that uh, are quite willing to get arrested to draw attention to the fact that uh, you know we're not meeting our targets in terms of the climate crisis and um, yes yeah, things like that are uh, I think going to amplify um, and yeah who knows how how we're going to respond then um, and so how does agriculture come into this so I would I always like to say in my trainings that uh, despite all our accomplishments as humans, we're kind of de very dependent on, on our life base, about 20 centimeters of soil and the fact that it rains. And so agriculture is a very key sector and it's uh, really strange how caught up it is in, in various policies and in various sort of um, tendencies that have been going on for, you know, at least since the end of the Second World War. And so um, it's really sh like very odd that not much more is being being done there, um, and that in general, to to produce one one calorie of food, we need ten to twelve calories of fossil fuels. And as Paul said already, we don't have any any real alternative. And so that's sort of um, also a political choice uh, that we've we found ourselves in. Um, so in that sense, um, if we look at agroecology or permaculture, because um, I, I sort of conflate some of these methods, uh, it seems to be a very key sector for, for regeneration as um, agriculture accounts for about a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. And then we also need to add other emissions linked um, within the entire food system. Um, and um, yeah, so, how can we how can we possibly do this? I would like to show some uh, some things for some uh, reason for hope, I guess, um, because we we see that agroecology uh, continues to grow. It might not be very very visible, but I think uh, there is a lot of um, people who are already regenerating whatever land they can get, get. Um, 
and then also adapting to climate change on the ground because the practitioners are most aware of what's really going on there. And in that sense, um, for me, both permaculture and agroecology are not just uh, have, don't have a scientific base right now. Um, in the last 10, 15 years, there have been more publications around this that sort of um, go against some of the more conventional soil science wisdom. Um, but uh, they're not just scientifically proven, but also this social movement behind them that encompasses more than just uh, restocking uh, carbon in the soil, but um, addressing larger issues that we have um, and access to land being one of them and uh, rights of communities to to eat healthy and things like that. Um, so I will I will talk about this uh, Ferme du Bec Elouin, uh, which I've studied for a while and which is one of the um, most studied as well permaculture farms uh, in in the world, I would say. Um, uh, they're in France and it's basically a micro farm with less than 10, 10 hectares of, of cultivated surface, but uh, they have like about 10 hectares of woodland as well. Um, which has been created in 2004. There's also new farmers, which is also an interesting, an interesting trend in this. Um, and it's basically polycultures um, that are quite intensified and that are sort of designed in a way that maximizes the, the synergies as well between them. And so they they do uh, basically, you know, the gardening, they do um, forest gardens as well of various types that have also been studied that there were some are more extensive, some, some are more intensive, and they've really been sort of developing this over the last, what, um, uh, yeah, more than, more than 15 years. Um, and so in terms of the permaculture methods that they use, they um, optimize the interactions of the soil plant systems for an efficient use of their ecological functions and also their ecosystem services while they also realize high yield from a small and they, they sustain soil fertility. So basically the main principles are to work manually, uh, to optimize plant densities, to input significant amounts of uh, organic materials. So that's sort of what, uh, what Paul was referring to in terms of the, the compost added. And that is probably an interesting um, way forward in some of, the, some of the agriculture we do. And then obviously not using mineral fertilizers or pesticides at all. And so this sort of intensification, so uh, biointensive growing, it can be strengthened as well by introducing sort of vertical space. So that's sort of the trees and um, various um, perennials that, that people introduce in these systems. And um, it's quite in big contrast with the, the more large scale conventional agriculture systems. Um, that really rely on mechanized tillage, that rely on use of mineral fertilizers, especially in the sort of, uh, if they want to do less till, then, you know, more um, more pesticides have to be used. Um, and so, yeah, these permaculture systems, um, they're working quite well, but for a long time, they were quite ignored by, by science. Um, there has been an increase in um, the the scientific publications uh, for the last 15 years. But a lot of them are sort of in interdisciplinary journals, not so much in the life sciences or in the soil science journals. Um, but they have a very obvious uh, advantages in terms of the more limited impacts that they have um, compared to con conventional agriculture. And they're also economically viable. Often they're sort of... Um, the stereotype is uh, being not very not very viable economically or not very productive in the in the traditional sense of the word. Um, but yeah, this is a uh, this is not the case. So, regards to design, um, yeah, this is just to uh, to see sort of what what bioavailability there is, and and it, it's higher than than in other sort of uh, com uh, systems. Uh, this is by the INRA. Uh, the French uh, Agriculture Research Institute that sort of um, showed that this sort of uh, biointensive agriculture is, is very productive per square meter. So you have a sort of value created that is around 55 um, euros per square meter, which is very, very much higher than mechanized organic market gardening. Um, 
So what is interesting to me and that is uh, as a sort of anthropologist, social science, um, is that um, you have this uh, very technical aspects, but then you also have the whole um, more holistic uh, strategic thinking that, that is happening uh, in this system um, where you start with this, um, what is possible without mechanization, and then you can sort of see how you can, you can reach this um, economic viability with the polycultures that, that are there. I mean, there's, there's also um, obviously lots of challenges with that, but it's, it's possible to, to put this, these things into practice. Um, yeah, so this is a, one of the, um, the limitations, I think, of one of these systems is that um, uh, there's a lot of organic matter, matter that has to be added to these um, biointensive gardening systems. Um, and the issue with that is uh, that it's often more than can be than can be done sort of in that in that context. Um, and so it needs to be brought from the outside of the system. And that's something that I think needs to be watched closely in terms of how, how it can be made more autonomous. And I think that's sort of the, one of the cruxes, um, how that's going to be integrated with other approaches where you, where you have too much organic matter, you know, if there's a whole scale transformation of, of these systems, then um, yeah, you need to have an, enough organic matter to put in. Um, and then also the forest gardens that they use, they, they have um, some challenges, um, but also a lot of possibilities um, because they, they integrate perennial crops that are then sort of uh, interesting for, for creating biomass, for improving the soil, for creating a very different type of uh, fungal dominated soil. And so that's um, an interesting element to, to integrate into into these systems. Um, and um, as I said, you know, it's sort of about maximizing the different interactions between um, the different systems. If you have a polyculture system to kind of see how to optimize that and to see whether you can be less and less reliant on the exterior of the, the farming system over time. Um, and maybe you've heard about homemakers, Charles, Charles Dowding's uh, no dig compost system, which has been much sort of imitated all across Europe uh, these days by um, farmers who are stacking up uh, vegetable growing systems. And that's also a system that um, I, I guess could be really easily integrated with uh, animal traction of some kind or animal, animal work. Um, this is a very small scale system of about 1,000 square meters um, that is in oil so biointensive and that is uh, with uh, compost that's mainly um, produced there. And there, where there has been also uh, interesting research, comparative research done with various test plots um, to kind of show the total production of of these um, these plots that are treated in, in different ways with organic matter. And um, yeah, what is what is interesting there to see is that more or less the the compost and no dig plus cow manure, um, you know, has uh, the consistently highest yields over over like what seven years. Um, so that's uh, an interesting interesting result. And also plant um, plant health is really good in these systems. The other thing that um, is striking me at our farm as we're sort of regenerating and some of and rewilding some of it is that we we get more and more biodiversity happening here, including rare bees that um, have only been sighted a couple of times in in this area of Belgium in the last ten years. Um, so I think there's there's a, this this idea of yields also um, including other things than just the productivity or the money around the farm. Uh, like seeing at biodiversity as a yield uh, seems very interesting in terms of uh, moving on from our productive systems that um, yeah, are ultimately also very destructive in that sense. Yeah, so I think uh, we're reflecting here on fossil free agriculture and it's, uh, it's one thing around um, 
growing vegetables and fruit without fossils, fossil fuels. Um, but it's another thing to, to grow cereals. And so that's something also that um, I think is something that's being tackled by, by these small scale uh, farms. Uh, La Ferme du Bacalouin, for instance, has a, a research program with participatory research. I haven't found any res results yet where they are looking at cereal production uh, in, in terms of fossil free. Um, so also involving draft animals, but um, then really looking at the, the varieties that can be used and that would work well for sort of garden cereal production. Historically, um, from the little research that I've done on this, and I would like to deepen this or have anybody else's input, um, this has been traditionally done. Uh, and there have been quite high yields for some varieties of cereals um, in a sort of garden context. And um, yeah, it's, I think this is really an exciting, exciting um, area of research in, in a sense to sort of look towards more food autonomy on a local scale. Um, and then also, yeah, one thing I wanted to say about these, uh, the selection of, of these varieties, um, often this sort of approach is seen as sort of a return to the past, but um, I think with sort of mod modern, let's say modern uh, research institutes involved, there can also be some kind of um, adaptation of, of varieties going on. You know, contemporary varieties might be interesting to use in, in some ways. Um, and so I think with the urgency that we face at the moment, I think it, it helps to look at all kinds of things and to say, okay, so we can look at contemporary varieties, all the varieties, whatever it takes. Um, yeah, so here there's some uh, exciting participatory research coming out in the next couple of years from France. And um, I found this picture, which I found really, really fascinating with 30, <laughs> 30 horses uh, drawing some kind of um, um, dressing machine. I don't know how to say this in, in, in English. And then there's also these exciting developments um, about the perennial grains. So Kanza is one of the experimental per uh, perennial grains coming from the Lands in Ant Institute in Kansas. There's some trial plots in, in Western Europe at the moment, but uh, it's at a very sort of uh, early phase. So if you ever eat Kanza bread, it's only going to be um, a small percentage of Kanza in it. Um, and um, not so much, yeah, it's not, not just that that we can use to, to make bread, for instance, but it's also one idea that is sort of increasingly brought and developed by permaculture practitioners around um, perennializing our, our food production in terms of um, the, um, the ecological gains and also in terms of the, the local possibilities that are, that are made there. Um, moving on. Um, so this is uh, from the Femme du Becalois, from their trials with, uh, with cereals and, and animal traction. Um, but um, my interest has also been in the last two years, as I, as I have a project around low-tech innovations more generally, uh, to look at sort of the, the stakeholders that are already doing interesting things in terms of low-tech. In mainly France, I've looked at. Um, so you have a various commons that are created um, by Latelier Paysan, for instance, who are developing various um, uh, tools to, to help small-scale agriculture be um, less uh, backbreaking and less labor-intensive. Um, and there's various uh, projects like that around the world. Maybe you know about open source ecology and this um, global village uh, set production, something like that. Um, global village construction set that's what the, that was called where you, you get the templates for various machines that you can then develop and um, I think this is um, also there's some more focus on, on gardening tools you know that are you know more ergonomic uh, and more interesting to use in, in these sort of uh, no dig contexts um, and for me this is a very uh, interesting development because it also creates comments around this, which is uh, one of the interesting things I think that also this leader project is, is going to create, namely that we are uh, faced with the urgency of things. Um, we need to 
prototype things fast. And if they don't work, we discard them. And if, if they work, then we can keep working on them. Um, yeah, because um, we might need all this stuff at some point. I think it's very, very relevant stuff. Um, anyway, so my summary, I wanted to perhaps have a bit more time for discussion afterwards. Um, so what I, what I bring to you is this um, um, problematic of the uncertainty crossroads as we approach the end of fossil fuel abundance uh, in conjunction with climate breakdown and various crises that are sort of uh, coming together. Um, Polytalk cultures and low tech means a sort of deep change in practices, perhaps deeper than we've ever seen. Um, the need for creating commons in low tech solutions, that it's, uh, it can't be just, um, you know, fenced off again by, by corporate interests. It needs to be, you know, commons for um, actual solutions. And uh, what, I, what I talked about as well was this uh, rethinking of yields. So that is not just money, but also the amount of carbon sec sequestrated, um, the biodiversity created, the well-being created, and that we, we don't think about all this as sort of just a sort of narrow economic sense of yield. Um, rethinking of our inputs, what we put in, in terms of fossil fuels, you know, now with the energy crisis, it's, it's getting more and more visible, but before fossil fuels was hard to talk about um, at all in, in, in agriculture. Um, also other types of inputs uh, like organic matter. Um, and then the other thing about all this um, change is also a rethinking of livelihoods, which at the moment, uh, I don't think there's a big, big desire of, of um, working in agriculture apart from some kind of ecological fringe people that might want to, to work there. But uh, yeah, so in terms of the, the amount of labor that it takes, if you don't have an abundance of fossil fuels, we have to have a, a straight discussion around that. And then finally, thinking of, of diets and uh, food regimes and also whatever that's sort of relating to in terms of um, social inequalities, and things like that. Um, yeah, I wanted to say that for the rest of the seminar, I'm going to be doing graphic recording. So I have behind me this big wall, like a three meter wall. And so I'll, I'll capture what, what is being said in, in images and, and words. Um, yeah, so thank you. And um, happy to keep the conversation going, if you like.